So hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Adriana Bankston. I'm currently the CEO and managing publisher for the Journal of Science Policy and Governance. And I wanna just provide a brief background of the journal for those of you that may not be familiar and we appreciate your attendance here today. So I'm gonna share the website in the chat. So JSPG is an internationally recognized open access and peer reviewed publication that we cover every corner of science and technology policy. And through the journal, we also bolster research and writing credentials for early career scholars in science policy and encourage them to engage in science policy discourse and debate. We publish a number of formats, including op-eds, technology assessments, policy memos, policy briefs, analyses, position papers, white papers, book reviews, workshop proceedings, and other articles. And we also promote the publications through our global mailing lists and events, such as workshops, webinars, and a podcast where we interview published authors. You can follow the journal on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We also have a YouTube channel where we'll post all of our recordings and we'll post today's as well. So if you wanna follow us, I'm gonna share all of our accounts in the chat where you can you can keep up, up to date with our events and issues. So now I would like to provide um, our issue sponsor, UCL Steep, an opportunity to provide a brief overview and then we'll talk a little bit about the issue and the event. So I'd like to introduce Professor Joanna Chataway, who is head of the department at UCL Steep. And prior to UCL, she was deputy director and professor of science and technology policy at SPRU at the University of Sussex. She also directed the Innovation, Health, and Science Research Group at RAND Europe and was previously Professor of Biotechnology and Development and Co-Director of the ES ESRC Innogen Research Center at the Open University. Thank you, Joanna, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Adriana, and it's a real pleasure to, to be here today and to partner with you uh, to host this webinar and um, uh, develop the, the special issue. Uh, on science diplomacy. So my department, Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy, STEEP, is based in the Faculty of Engineering at uh, UCL. And as a department, we really exist to better understand and improve the flow of knowledge between science, technology, innovation and, and policy. And that's important to us. It's crucial to us because we think that, that, uh, that understanding that connection, improving the flow of knowledge uh, between policy and, uh, and, and academia is crucial to making uh, the knowledge uh, that we produce, that we co-produce useful. Um, and that's important because uh, it's how we try and make the research that we do, the evidence and knowledge that we contribute uh, to making um, social and economic realities better for people. Um, and of course, science diplomacy, I'm so sorry, I've got my cat who's, this is homeworking. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, but so, so science diplomacy is really a vital mix of, of uh, uh, it's science diplomacy is an important part of that complex mix that we need to transform evidence and research into ways of improving the world. Um, and so I'm really excited ab about today's uh, webinar. We have a great panel looking forward to the discussion. Uh, just it, it, important to say that for STEEP, it's part of a longer term ambition to integrate science policy into our research and our teaching. So we're integrating it already into our MPA and we're launching an undergraduate degree uh, which we will also um, uh, be uh, incorporating uh, science uh, diplomacy issues into. We're launching that in 2023. So just let me finish by saying a huge thank you to JC, to Adriana, to other organizers of the event. Um, it's the first time we've partnered uh, with uh, your journal, uh, but we hope there'll be lots of other opportunities and we're looking forward to the workshop and to the special issue itself. Great. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And again, really appreciate UCL sponsoring the issue. And so I'll tell you a little bit about the special issue in the background now. So late last year, JSPG and UCL Steep launched a call for papers and competition focused on the latest policy developments and issues in science diplomacy. And the submission deadline is April 3rd. The issue is supported in kind by outreach partners from INCSA, the European Union Science Diplomacy Alliance and the Global Young Academy Incubator Group on Science Diplomacy in the Americas. 
So I will share the links again to our call for papers and events in the chat so you can see, uh, look at the call as well. So you can go to the next slide, please. So as part of this call for papers, we organized a series of events as we are today on engaging thought leaders in the field to discuss the most important topics for the next generation to focus on within science diplomacy. The first webinar was in January focused on science diplomacy interfaces to address global challenges. And today we will talk about inclusivity in science diplomacy. And finally, in March, we'll have a writing workshop to help prospective authors improve their submissions to the issue and practice policy writing around diplomacy topics. So for today's event, we encourage you to live tweet. If you hear something interesting, you'd like to share it on social media and please tag us. And we'll also provide the opportunity to whoever tweets the most uh, to share their impressions on the blogs. We'll write a summary of the event afterwards. So I'll also share the uh, Twitter handles for us and our partners. Uh, feel free to tag us and follow the partners on Twitter as well. So next slide. So moving on to today's event, uh, just a few logistics. Please mute your microphones and turn off your video so we can focus on the panelists. During the discussion, you can ask your questions in the chat for the speakers, either send them to me directly or to the moderator in the private chat, um, so we're not disturbing the, the conversation. So I want to just give a very, very brief background on the event. Um, so obviously, science diplomacy is a relatively recent field of research. Uh, there are still many systemic issues that result in equity differences in practitioners and scholars in the field. So this webinar will look at equity, inclusion, and diversity issues in science diplomacy with a particular emphasis on the intergenerational gap. And we have a very distinguished panel here today and we're really grateful for their participation. And with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Christian Allen, who is Associate Director for Policy and International Engagement at the University of Oakland. She is also a founding member of INCSA, where she directs the Secretariat. And more broadly, she is a senior policy practitioner turned researcher with an interest in how policy discourses are created and embedded, as well as agile policymaking processes that can better engage with the social and ethical implications of new technologies. Over the years, Christian has worked at the intersection of science, public policy in multiple contexts internationally, including provincial, federal, and multilateral systems, and she has a lot of experience in the field. Most recently, she served as the Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor. And prior to this, she worked within the science policy system in her native Canada. And with that, I'll turn it over to Christian to introduce our panel. Thank you very much, Adriana and colleagues. It's a delight to, to be here to help moderate this panel and um, to speak with um, many eminent uh, names in the field. Um, from whom we'll hear about the challenges of uh, inclusivity in science diplomacy. Um, like uh, many of us on this panel, we wear, I wear many hats, and uh, today uh, I'm really pleased to be here um, with the INSA hat on. INSA has been involved um, in science diplomacy from its inception through our work in um, helping to establish and, and, and organize the Foreign Ministry's um, Science Technology and Advice Network in the area of science advice. Um, but even in that title, um, Foreign Ministry's Science Technology and Advice Network is uh, encapsulated the issue of inclusivity and the issue of um, um, needing to work more broadly than the ministries themselves with non-state actors. And that's something that INSA strives to do. And um, so all the more reason to be speaking with our um, panelists here today. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce them. Um, we have got three eminent names in the field. Um, I will open this and starting with Professor Melody Birkins. She is director of the Institute of Arctic Studies and senior associate director at the, Jones, at the John Sloan Dickey Center for International uh, Understanding. She's also adjunct professor in environmental studies at Dartmouth. Um, Melody's got over 30 years of experience as a polar scientist working in academe and governance, and she's an advocate for policy engaged scholarship, experiential education, and um, 
and the support of policy and diplomacy initiatives in advancing sustainability and EDI issues in general in Arctic and around the world. With Melody, we've got um, Dr. Binyam Sise Mendusu. Binyam is an Ethiopian linguist turned teacher, policy, and science for policy specialist. He's an associate professor of African languages and linguistics at the African Institute in Sharjah, the United Arab Emirates. Binyam trained at the University of Oslo. Uh, he was a Next Einstein Forum ambassador for 2017 to 2019. In 2019, he was an INSA research associate, and he serves on the steering committee of the African Science Leadership Program. And he's also worked in teacher education and curriculum development at UNESCO. And to top it all off, Bing, uh, Binyam was um, recently elected as an inaugural VP of INSA, uh, where he brings his expertise in capacity development to our organization. What did I say about wearing many hats? Um, also in the many hats camp is uh, Professor Romain Morenzi, who is executive director of UNESCO uh, TWAS, the World Academy of Science. He's former minister of science for Rwanda and a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences. In July 2016, he served for a year as director of the Division of Science Policy and Capacity Building at UNESCO's Natural Sciences Sector. And he was previously director of the Center for Science, Technology, and Sustainability at the AAAS in Washington, DC. He was also chair of the Department of Physics uh, at Atlanta University. He also chairs the UN Secretary General's high-level panel of technology, bank, and science, technology, and innovation supporting mechanisms, which are dedicated to the least developed countries. And he's a member of the ITU UNESCO Broadband Commission for Digital Development and of the Carnegie Mellon University President's Global Advisory Council. Welcome all of our panelists. It's really exciting to talk to you today um, about um, ideas of, of, of inclusivity and broadening out notions of science uh, diplomacy. So I would just like to start with um, a first round um, of, of uh, statements from each of you in turn. Um, I would welcome you introducing yourselves further, talking about your own uh, experiences in science diplomacy, but in particular drawing attention to um, how non-state actors have contributed and maybe some of the challenges uh, in their contribution. And perhaps we can start with um, Professor um, Brown-Birkins, Melody. Can we hear from you for a few minutes? Absolutely. And thank you so much. Uh, I'm so honored to be here and the organizers have done such an incredible job. So, um, and thank you to all of you who are showing up and, and listening to us talk. I hope you do follow us or we can follow you as well. Um, so thank you for the introduction gave uh, many hats and in the in the interest of many hats, I would do let me say that um, I came into science diplomacy as a scientist. Uh, first, I worked in the, I actually grew up in Alaska, did some science in Alaska. So Alaska and the Arctic have always been a part of me. Um, but I actually did my PhD in Antarctica. And so, and it was there in Antarctica that I actually worked with Alaskan, I met Alaskan uh, politicians and US politicians who I started to think about how science policy was, was actually how science was funded. I went into science policy in the US government um, and became an advisor to a Senator. And then I started working at the interface of academia policy and diplomacy for many years. And part of that was with the US National Academy of Sciences. Um, I now chair the board of international scientific organizations which is about cooperation and inclusion. Um, I work uh, on the second term of my governing board of the International Science Council which is a global body of scientists from all from natural physical social sciences thinking about science as a public good works closely with the UN and INCSA and others uh, INCSA is uh, connected to us in a great way and then most recently um, one of the groups that I work with is something you may not know but it's called the University of the Arctic or U Arctic which is about 200 organizations um, around the circumpolar north that includes the indigenous peoples of the north and uh, works with the Arctic Council which is something I'll talk about when we uh, I'll say a little bit more in just a minute. But that's really where my work on science diplomacy and inclusion has come together most directly. And part of that um, 
is really the understanding that all of the institutions I've worked with most of my life have been very Western and we can we can call them colonial institutions. It's where I got my multiple hats and my PhD. And um, but I did grow up in a place where there was there were indigenous communities and um, in in Alaska. And I think coming full circle back to Dartmouth, I actually got my PhD here, but really understanding um, taking on work with the Institute of Arctic Studies and with our partner UArctic um, has been really eye opening and important to me, not only on issues of gender inclusion, which I've fought, fought and thought about for most of my uh, career, but actually on inclusion of different ways of knowing and how science diplomacy, if it's not inclusive, we are actually just limiting our science, our knowledge to uh, a science that does not really bring all of the richness of the knowledge of, of peoples who have not gone through our specific systems to the science diplomacy table. And so I've really committed myself as the now becoming the director of the Institute of Arctic Studies. And I was just named um, for the University of the Arctic, uh, a chair, a five-year chair in science diplomacy and inclusion. This is what I really want to do. Um, and the, the reasons are because uh, the Arctic, I believe, gives us a model for how we connect science cooperation, knowledge cooperation, and the co-production of knowledge with uh, self-governing indigenous peoples of the North with uh, the Western or the uh, nations systems. And that's how the Arctic Council works. It has eight Arctic nations, as well as the six permanent participants, which are the indigenous peoples of the North and their governance and how they think, how there is a thought about how you launch projects and knowledge production in the Arctic is always with the thought of how how, are, how is indigenous knowledge, traditional and ecological knowledge, different ways of knowing represented in our knowledge structure of creating the science but also how we, uh, how we actually don't take knowledge. We must realize we have to compensate people for knowledge. Those are not expert knowledge holders in, they're just in a different system. We get paid for it as tenured academics, but we should not be just taking knowledge from communities. So we need to think about compensation. We need to think about human rights. And, the, the, and we also need to think about returning and reciprocity, the knowledge that comes through our papers and journals. We have to not only develop our knowledge with talking with the people on the in the ground on the ground who have indigenous and traditional knowledge but we actually have to find ways to take the knowledge once we've published it and disseminated it how do we move it back to those communities who gave it and who actually would like to have a more um, tangible use of the knowledge on the ground for sustainable development for climate change we should not be just putting these uh, in journals on a shelf so this is some of the work i do i'm committed to and again it brings me full circle from growing up in the north to now being able to be part of the science diplomacy and inclusion of the north thank you Thanks, Melody. That's um, that's so interesting. You know, thinking about the Arctic as a as a, a model, an exemplar of um, questions of inclusion in science diplomacy, and what you drew attention to not just not just um, inclusion of different actors and different voices, but epistemic inclusion as well in different ways of knowing. Um, um, issues of compensation, of human rights, and um, just the the more cooperative exercise. Of, of learning um, from other ways of knowing. Um, so hopefully we'll come back to that in the ensuing discussion. But let me turn now to Dr. Binyam Sise Mendisu. Uh, Binyam, can you give us a few comments to start? Thank you very much, Christian. Can you hear me well? Yes, thanks. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and uh, many thanks for Rian and her team for the invitation to be part of this panel. Uh, just to say a little bit about myself, I, uh, as I am a linguist by training, and uh, for the most part of my, my, my study, uh, my focus has been on the study and documentation of least known and least studied languages, and the ways in which they could be integrated into education. So inclusivity has been part of my concern in my work as a linguist. And then recently working for UNESCO and being involved in providing technical support to several African countries in their teacher policy development gave me another opportunity to gain practical experience in evidence informed policy making and all the inclusivity issues that comes with it. 
And finally, uh, probably it was to mention that I'm a member of the Global Young Academy. And last year I served as a co-leader of its uh, science advice working group. And as uh, Christian mentioned earlier, it is uh, a huge uh, opportunity and honor to be elected last year to serve as a governing board member of INSA and its vice president for capacity development. Currently I'm based at the African Institute. Uh, as part of my opening remark, I want to engage very briefly why inclusivity? Why be inclusive? And what, it, what is in it for the field and for the society? So why? Uh, let me mention two points in that regard. First, I may be stating the obvious, but it's always worth reminding ourselves as researchers the issues that we engage in science diplomacy are very complex and highly transdisciplinary. This also means that issues we explore are full of contestations and marred with ambiguity and involve a diversity of stakeholders. In my opinion, acknowledging the inherent complexity and multifacetedness helps us to continuously ask and engage questions of representation, questions of redefinition, question of, questions of reimagination, and the questions of remembering. In fields such as science diplomacy, questions of representation need to be always raised at systemic levels. And this systemic imbalances, be it between global north versus global south, or gender, disciplinary, or intergenerational issues, they have history. And it's worth exploring the historical roots and the practice today. Hence, questions such as whose ideology and values are overrepresented or underrepresented or not represented at all is, I think, something worth further interrogating and continuously studying and what we can do about it. Uh, and the same goes with indiscrepancies or imbalances um, in line with disciplines, methodologies, communities, issues and topics and so on and so forth. So in short, what I'm trying to say is due to its very tra transdisciplinary and mul multifarious nature, questions of inclusivity are inherent to science diplomacy Accordingly, it's a fertile area for research and, and engagement. And the second point I would wish to raise very briefly is uh, on uh, uh, the connection uh, and the, re the relevance of inclusivity. So why are we continuously striving to be inclusive? And how genuine are we with our efforts and are we ready to face the ambiguity, the uncertainty, and the contestation it reveals in our assumptions, methodologies, and values? Uh, I, I think one major trap that we may need to avoid are efforts of inclusivity driven uh, uh, either to be politically correct and or as a service or being sympathetic to the groups that are excluded. In my view, efforts of inclusivity need to be driven, one, in order to come up with a better understanding of complex issues at hand, because that uh, makes us closer to the reality on the ground. Second, because diverse and inclusive perspectives are our best bet to come up with long-term and sustainable interventions. This is to the benefit of all, you know, those who are overrepresented or underrepresented or not represented. And this is very much collect, uh, connected to uh, sustainability, which is also the connection between sustainability and inclusivity, which is also another fertile area of study and exploration. Thank you, Christian. Thank you so much, Binyam. Um, and thank you especially for drawing our attention to the fact that this is hard work. Um, you talked about the um, contested nature of, of the issues that science diplomacy deals with and at the heart of um, needing 
inclusivity is that contested nature. First of all, being more inclusive helps us reveal the contested nature, but it also helps us to um, confront it. You talked about the many levels uh, of, of, of representation and, and inclusivity at many levels, whether they are at the level of the practitioner, um, with regards to, to, to gender, to discipline, et cetera, or the level of the organization with regards to the types of non-state um, actors, or uh, certainly the, the global level um, with regards to um, the sort of imbalances, historical imbalances between um, Global South and Global North. And finally, um, I really um, appreciate your drawing our attention to the inherent ambiguity and the need to understand and, and really familiarize ourselves, um, get, get comfortable with ambiguity in this space um, to, to help to question our assumptions, um, our own methodologies and our values that have predominantly you know, come from, as, as you said, the global north. And so understanding the historical roots and the ideological roots of those is really important. And I hope to get back to that in the questions as well. Um, so thank you for that. But let's turn to Professor Romain uh, Murenzi. Uh, Romain, can we have some opening remarks from you? Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Melody, Vignan, Christian, and Adriana. Uh, yeah, and I thank really for the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, to participate in this uh, in this debate. Um, so I had an opportunity actually to serve uh, for close to a decade as Minister of Rwanda for, for, for Science, Technology, and and um, and also part of Information Communication Technologies. Back in 2001, when I left Clark Atlanta University to become the Minister of Education, but actually the first Minister of Science in the history of Rwanda, and actually at the continental level, it was the first time where there was a combination between education and, uh, uh, and science. But when I arrived in Rwanda, actually, I have never seen even a, a document of law even a piece of law or, or an article of law. I've never seen a, a policy. When I read the ministry, I said, what is a policy? So it took me time uh, to understand what's a policy. But at the time also, though, it was the time of the, the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, people were focusing more on reducing poverty. And uh, also in terms of education, uh, it was the, the time of the what they call the education for all. Uh, really, donors did, were not in, interested in really funding a science at all. It was uh, most of donors would be interested in building uh, classrooms and roofs and, and so forth. So the issue of information technology in schools or, or, or labs were not other uh, important. And during that, that period, of course, I, I work on the issue of education policy, uh, higher education, primary education, secondary and higher education. And then after finishing the, those piece of policies and, and, and the legislations, I turned to the uh, Rwandan SARS policy. Uh, I worked with the, with, uh, um, the uh, uh, Australia uh, CSIR, uh, I worked with them in, in producing the, 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 the background policy a document paper. I worked with UNESCO, we tried to work with the donors. Uh, we, we, we worked with the, our partners in, in the country to try to, to make them understand the importance of science. And I could see at the time it was not really uh, important. But also what was important was that how do you write a document that really can be implemented, a live document. So to cut the story short, after we, we wrote the, the policy on, on, on science, uh, after a lengthy consultation with the donors and and the government stakeholders, everybody. And after the, actually the president of Rwanda came to the meeting at the University of Rwanda and the head of the DFIT, the Department for International Development, the UK uh, at the time, uh, and the ambassador for the inauguration. After that, I said, how do we implement this, this document? So I actually had an opportunity to go to the UK and I met with uh, Sir uh, David King I informed me my challenges. Told me, I would like really this document to be really a live document. I would like to work with the parliament. So actually David King came to Rwanda 
in 2006, and he was able to address the uh, parliamentarians, you know, both uh, the uh, the Senate and, and the, the Lord Chamber and the, and the Upper Chamber. So that was very important. And later on, David King became actually part of the advisory body of the science advisory body of the of President Kagame. And also, I thought it was important also to make sure that the main donor of Rwanda's education understand it. So I invited also uh, Sir David Conway. Uh, he came to Rwanda with the, the chief economist um, of the of the of DFI. He came to Rwanda and spent uh, two days and spoke with the all the stakeholders in in science uh, and, and and education. Uh, and that document also was very important. Also, I thought it was also important to make sure that Rwanda links with international. So uh, we, I worked, I can say that I worked with uh, the ambassador in Rwanda, and of course with, uh, with uh, Sir David, David King, and the president of Rwanda addressed in 2006 the Royal Society. And he, he gave a, a very interesting piece of, of, of policy orientation for Rwanda and for Africa. But also, same thing, also I worked with the triple S. President Kagame also spoke at the opening, uh, the annual meeting of triple S. At the annual meeting, he gave a talk, and that was also very important. And during that time, also President Kagame met with uh, uh, the president of MIT, and President Kagame went to MIT. Uh, that is recorded on the internet. You can you can follow that. So this, my idea was that it was in, very important. The document, which was a very small document, where we're documenting things that we wanted to do to make sure that actually the government of Rwanda understand that science is not just only for Rwanda. You need to you do science with other stakeholders, not only in the nation, but in the region and and and, and outside. So that was uh, it became very important, and then, and later on, I left Rwanda in two thousand and nine, and then I went to Triple S, where I spent two years there as a senior scholar at the Center for Science Diplomacy, and uh, I retrieved some of the things that uh, we have done in in Rwanda, and we tried to work to bring people from the East Africa community uh, together. We organized some workshop in that. My idea was that. Uh, uh, creating in the East Africa a space for science. Science is an honest broker. Knowledge allows people, they have something they can use when they are discussing. And I have observed during my time in, in Rwanda uh, that, for example, um, Rwanda shares with Congo and Uganda the Virunga Mountain. The Virunga Mountain, you have the gorilla mount, the gorilla that we all know. So these gorillas, they, they don't belong to any country. They belong to the three countries. So even when the, there was a, the, the relationship between the two countries were not up to date, the scientists, they had to meet. And I had an opportunity to be part of the discussion. I was representing Rwanda at the, 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 the uh, DFGFI, the um, uh, uh, Diana Fossey Gorilla Fund International, uh, the organization NGO that was actually managing uh, the Virunga uh, Mountains uh, 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 Gorilla in terms of helping, in terms of science, in terms of uh, also um, health and, and, and issues of that. That example helped me a lot because I could see how science, because science brings truth, why these people were sitting together there, they used the talk science. Although the, re the relationship between the country and sometimes not doing well, the countries actually allowed the scientists and the specialists to meet because they thought they had something, something to share. During that period also, uh, uh, backtrack in, in Rwanda, you can go back now and see some of the, the institutions that have been built in Rwanda, for example, Building, building, uh, uh, having Carnegie Mellon University in Kigali, having the Institute for Physics UNESCO, even now recently establishing um, a biodiversity uh, uh, UNESCO category two centers. The idea was how do you make, at least at that time, 
my country Rwanda a center for knowledge where people from the region will come and use knowledge not only knowledge for knowledge purposes but for development but also as a piece you know the biodiversity center that was just now accepted by UNESCO as category two started in 2007 and they could, although I was not in Rwanda I continue to follow up on a regular basis until its establishment now Rwanda sit at the center of the Albertine Rift going from South Sudan to down to Lake Tanganyika in Burundi and the strip that Rwanda sit at has 50 percent of the mammals of Africa continental birds and some plants that are very very important for the continent and for the region so by building a center like that you bring people from the region together so they have something to share rather than going into ethnic background killing each other and, and bringing the negatives how do you bring the scientists from the region how do you bring the youth from the region for a common cause to build the science for development for the region and I thought that that was something that was very important and then I'm probably going to, to stop there and uh, when I joined I joined uh, 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 Tuas before I left in 2011 to go to Tuas Vogan Turekian asked me Roman what can we do together so we said together we said okay we could do a course on science diplomacy because I think that we go beyond the science policy because if if we can train people who have scientific background and diplomatic background on the importance of knowledge for peace and science in particular bring that will be very very important so that's mm -hmm. why for uh, more than a decade now we have a course uh, close to a decade we have every summer a, a course with three players on on, on science diplomacy. So I can stop here because of we need to, to do the discussions, but I'll be able to respond to questions. And, and I think this is a great opportunity really to, to engage with, uh, with you guys. Yeah. Thank you so much, Romain. Um, I, I especially appreciated um, your drawing our attention to the implementation issues in those early days um, and what it really takes to um, go from the idea to the implementation, especially when you're dealing with issues um, of a global scale that, that, that certainly have local impact and you want to engage locally, you want to engage the region, um, but in your case, um, where the capacity also needed to be looked at um, within the region and including that within your implementation questions. Um, you also talked about uh, the, the sort of the, the slate of um, non-state um, actors that you worked with in those early days, the Royal Society, introductions to MIT for the Rwandan um, minister, etc. And I think that it's really important to, uh, to understand the sort of um, those kinds of mechanisms of science diplomacy that work at um, a very personal level as well. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn to um, some questions. And what I think I'll do is just, uh, I've got some questions here that I might just uh, take you in turn and maybe give you uh, each a different question in this round. And then we'll open it up um, quickly to uh, our audience who's uh, listening um, with us today. So taking you up on some of the issues that you raised in your opening remarks, um, I might first turn to Melody, just thinking about sort of who are the non-state actors um, typically involved in science diplomacy. Uh, and one of the things that struck me about your remarks was how that slate of non-state actors is really broadening out. Um, you talked about, in particular, indigenous organizations and the issues of um, having to deal with the history of colonialism uh, in your work. And I wonder if you can talk about, a little bit about sort of that broader scope of non-state actors and how they contribute. And what are some of the challenges in, in fact, broadening out who we might consider to be the non-state actors? So typically we might think of uh, academies, 
uh, universities, um, uh, you know, groups that deal with large uh, scientific infrastructure as the types of non-state actors uh, in science diplomacy. But can you tell us a, a little bit more about Indigenous organizations or Indigenous NGOs and, and how that broadens out and what it means to also, to take up some of Binion's comments, to also broaden out the uh, uh, epistemologically um, that slate of non-state actors. Um, can I turn that to, question to you, Melody? Sure, and, and let me tell you first, let me say that I am learning every day about how to do this. And um, so, and I hope everyone else will stay open. But this is not the world I originally worked in is to, was science diplomacy as in the science structure of, that I grew up in at, uh, in, in uh, Western universities and diplomacy as federal, you know, as formal foreign policy actors, how I first uh, and policy was from the Capitol Hill to the people. I had a very interesting, you know, that was my version of science policy and diplomacy, um, really until I started recognizing that the best science policy I did when I worked for a senator was when I went back to Vermont and went down a driveway and talked to someone at their house about what was important to them mm -hmm. and what the work I was doing in Vermont for the senator and with the senator was actually doing on the ground. And those voices in our, luckily, hopefully in our democracies do get towards us and our systems are made to, to help those come forward. But they were from Vermont and I knew where they lived. And there were many voices that needed other groups to speak with them or for them because not everyone knows how to speak to a Senator's office. Uh, it started then. And I think that's been a piece of what I've understood is that our systems, um, uh, often hear certain people who speak a certain way with a cer in a certain structure, and that it is our job, if we're thinking about inclusion, to in science, in diplomacy, and in all of our governance, to be thinking about who are we not hearing from and why, and that is about youth voices, because, oh, they don't know enough yet. They, sh they, they shouldn't be. That was, that was, I'd heard that before. No, the youth, uh, my students teach me every day. Um, that my, my kids teach me every day. And those are the kinds of, they're, they're about to live in this world and we need to hear from them. I'd often say that if we are going to be creating a more just, sustainable and equitable world with our science, then our science better be informed more inclusively, equitably, and justly. You can't create without that. So that is a premise. Um, the work in, uh, in the Arctic is, the wonderful news is that long before I got here, the Arctic has actually been moving to developing these inclusive structures. Partly the, again, I go back to the Arctic Council, it was created formally in 1996, but actually has its roots a decades before in environmental cooperation agreements for the Arctic, you know, some analogies to the Antarctic, but there were no people in the Antarctic when we created science and peace treaties. In the Arctic, early brilliant people, many indigenous leaders said, no, we will be at the table and we will be part of this future governance of sustainability, environmental protection. And that is how the Arctic Council was originally formed and University of the Arctic, which is part, sort of an arm of the Arctic Council was created by the Arctic Council to inform the Arctic Council, um, also has those roots. So I am very honored to be part of a system that cr was created with that at its core, that, um, that indigenous people's voices across transboundary uh, groups, the, the permanent participants of the Arctic Council, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, um, the Gwich'in uh, Council, they operate across our normal boundaries of Alaska, Canada, Greenland, Russia. And they speak with a voice together at the Arctic Council on issues of environmental protection and sustainability that is, yes, is not your normal, uh, what you'd call it, a, a normal state actor. <laughs> um, they are a different, but they're not, nor are they part of the, uh, what we would have considered sort of an Arctic coalition of nations. They bring a different voice, a, 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 a history. And I will say what's really important is this, uh, the, the, the importance of, they, many of them have worked at the highest levels of the UN and are very clear that self-determination and human rights are the core Yes, science diplomacy and science is, is interesting, but at its core, it has to be about people and their self-determination and their rights. And therefore, to I think the, the interesting thing I'm learning is how does science diplomacy, this system that we have created, even as it, can it be better if we deconstruct it and reconstruct it as 
uh, knowledge engagement with these di with diverse ways of knowing. And again, we may need to do that. We can't do that ourselves. We have to bring in others with that knowledge. And that way, science diplomacy, whatever it becomes called, <laughs> is actually a space where we not only think about these issues of um, how science informs global challenges, uh, but we're actually bringing in all the voices and peoples and cultures and languages that we need to actually implement that change for a future more sustainable planet. So I mentioned a few of the key issues are self-determination. Uh, I, I will say a, 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 um, a, real, um, a real concern about current and previous interactions with governments who do not uh, who do not respect indigenous rights or indigenous voice. And therefore there's a large on a social justice issue. There's a huge issue of resentment and distrust. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of work to be done. And then the other pieces I did, I mentioned, I did mention was that a lot of us do this as paid part of our careers, but to actually, uh, I think uh, you mentioned this um, remain is the idea that needs to be a, a capacity and a structure that allows people to engage with our with with the current structures that we have at least we 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 may not hear from folks just because they don't have the time they don't have the the money to take some time and sit with us about a paper or a, a an issue that may be of importance to them but they see lots of scientists come through they take all this data they leave do they really want to do that again or is there some value to engaging more and more actually indigenous communities and actually this is in uh, in Canada and in Alaska, communities are creating their own uh, subnational groups where it is actually incumbent upon scientists to follow the rules that have been set for knowledge creation. We do not, the, the Western groups are not, are not the ones in, who get to lead. It's actually important for the indigenous peoples to lead and define the, the rules of that engagement. Mm -hmm. And that is, as I said, something we're learning all the time. But I actually think it will lead to better science, better knowledge, and actually a path forward for us to use that knowledge in international, um, everything from the local to the international and actually tackling these global challenges in a more sustainable, equitable and inclusive way. Great. Thank you for that. I, I, um, your your um, example in the Arctic, I think is important to show not just uh, the importance of structures of governance, new structures of governance, but also that these can and should go hand in hand with um, new structures for capacity development, especially when we're dealing with, um, you know, the 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 the, the non-dominant forms of knowledge um, that have predominantly uh, been with us for so many years. And when we're changing that, um, so too should we be offering opportunities through capacity development. And I think that. Binyam had also made that um, uh, made, made that observation as well. Um, so, you know, moving from maybe that broader organizational scale and indeed global scale, when you're talking about Arctic and and, and Arctic knowledge as a as a real global public good. Um, I'd like to maybe move move now to sort of a, um, the practice level, the practice scale, and turn to Binyam. Um, when we think about imbalances in the practice of science diplomacy, what are some of the the challenges, the real imbalances that you might see um, in in sort of um, the equity, diversity, and inclusion issues um, in the practice and uh, the craft of science diplomacy? And how can we, how can we um, really confront those and, and um, find some solutions at that level? And, and in finding those solutions, um, how will that make the practice of science, how will it improve the practice of science diplomacy? Can I ask uh, you, Binyam, to comment on that? Thank you very much, Christian, again. Uh, I, I think it has already been well, uh, highlighted that this sort of imbal imbalances and problems or uh, challenges of representation, in, in my opinion, they are going to persist. They are going to be there. Uh, the most important thing is to acknowledge that there are always these imbalances and representations that we need to confront because science diplomacy similar to other fields, as I mentioned earlier, they, there is a complexity to it. There is a transdisciplinariness to it. There are several stakeholders involved from local to global, and then there is a history to it. So 
the imbalances will be there. The question is, what do we do about it? And uh, that, so, so I think continuous engagement with inclusivity, uh, both at the research, at the, at the practice, in my opinion, is, is very important. Uh, the imbalances can be, uh, you know, shown and can, can reveal themselves in different ways. Uh, as I mentioned, global north, global south, or disciplinary, and, and so on and so forth. Let me just mention probably two that I'm um, a bit more uh, acquainted with. One is, for example, when we always say, we talk about science, and the sciences include, you know, all the sciences, including the art, the humanities, the social sciences. But uh, from, from my uh, experience, from what we see, you know, there, there is still uh, an imbalance. There is still over representation of one over the other, especially the humanities and the social sciences and the arts are not, or the perspectives from these fields are not as represented as they should be. And I, I relate this to the fact that at the end of the day, you know, what it, it has to whatever engagement that we are doing in science diplomacy or in other fields, it has to be human centered. And the perspectives that come and the insights that come from this disciplines are those that reminds us to be relevant to the question of the human. So uh, although there are several attempts, I think this, the, you know, the place of social sciences, humanities, arts in this science, uh, in the place of science is something that we need. I think there is an imbalance and it's all, we should always make an effort to, to balance it because at the end of the day, it's, it's relevant to the, to the sustainability and long term uh, of, the, of the interventions. The second uh, obvious and persisting problem that Melody has also talked about it and uh, Romain also talked about it in terms of you know, organizing those um, science diplomacy training course is the intergenerational uh, lack of, you know, intergenerational perspectives. There are, once again, uh, you know, encouraging attempts here and there, but it's still, I think, very important to always make sure that uh, fresh, innovative, and new perspectives are always integrated into our discussions and into our engagements. Uh, I want to appreciate uh, INSA for what it has been doing over the years, especially uh, as a member of the Global Young, Young Academy. I have benefited a lot and I have learned a lot with the opportunities to learn more about science and policy, the interface between science and policy, but also to get opportunities for mentorship and for networking. So that I think that INSA and GUI partnership is one very good example where we can really see uh, you know, inputs from, from early career and young generations have been consistently uh, integrated. And the, what, what we are doing today with the, the, the Journal of Science Policy and Governance, inviting a call for young and early career uh, scholars to contribute to this issue is also another good example. So these are, I think, the practical things that are being done we can learn from and we can expand. Thank you, Binyam. And uh, I know many of us, and certainly myself included, would absolutely applaud and echo your call for the role of um, social sciences and humanities and arts in this in this field and and just really helping to create more of a, a transdisciplinary approach to how we um, look at and and conceive of science diplomacy both in a scholarly way but also in the practice um, and there's a lot to learn there um, we're coming up very close to time but um, there's lots more questions and I, so I, what I think I'll do is I'll combine um, one of the questions that came through from the audience previously and, um, and, and one that I had in mind to ask um, to Romain. Um, Romain, when we're thinking about uh, 
the issue of science diplomacy, looking at the, the difference in sort of scales moving from the local to the global and back again, and thinking about that shifting narrative um, that we talked about at the beginning, where it had really been dominated and originated from the global north and, and wanting to be more inclusive of uh, global south. I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering about the role of the diaspora, the, the highly qualified scientific uh, diaspora from countries in the global south and, and, and what role they can play, whether through their organizations or individually. You talked about this in your opening remarks, um, introducing you know, uh, ministers to, uh, in Rwanda to um, university presidents in the US and, and you played a role there as, as the highly qualified diaspora. Can you talk a little bit more about what role um, individuals or organizations can play in linking uh, the, and shifting that narrative from Global North to Global South and giving more voice to Global South? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and I will come back to some, some of the, the points that uh, Melody and Vinyam said, so, but I'd like to, to answer to, 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 to that question. Um, I think that uh, it, it is very important to understand that everybody, any scientist, has a role to play if you want to do it, because you may decide not to do it. There is always a choice. <laughs> so in, in 1994, after the, the, the genocide, uh, coming back to, to my background, I, I grew up as a refugee in Burundi. So this means I take out the heart not only the that issue and i part of my my life i was a, a refugee scientist so I, I could call it a refugee scientist so so here i i can say i arrived in the us in 1992 uh, at clark atlanta university and then basically before going to the us i complained to a, a, a friend a priest that uh, I was hoping to go back to Africa. Now I'm going to the US. And that priest told me, no, 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 the world is around. One day you return back to Africa. I don't know, he, he made that, <laughs> that prediction. So in 1992, um, I arrived at Clark Atlanta University. I started to work and then the, the genocide happened in, in Rwanda. So in 1996, after two years after the genocide, actually a few, few months, like several months, let's say, I can say 18 months after the genocide, I and uh, uh, Claire Richardson, the, the, the CEO of the Diana Fossey Guerrilla International in Atlanta, she wanted to return back to Rwanda to see how she can help. Also, they are running the Virunga, the Virunga Mountain Guerrilla uh, uh, labs and things like that. So, so actually, we traveled together in Rwanda in 1996. And I went, I spent a full day at the University of Rwanda, actually two days. And I was so impressed to see that at the University of Rwanda, what you have with these Burundian, Congolese, Kenyans, Tanzanian, who were teaching at the university because most teachers in Rwanda at the university were killed or those who were not killed, some of them killed their, 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 their colleagues and they fled the country. This means the country didn't have any teacher at the university at all. However, you have all these teachers from the region. So what I did from 1996 to actually to 2000, almost every summer, I will go to Rwanda and teach a class. And I said, I will not wait until I have money to build the lab. However, I'm a boy scout. You can do in bon action quotidien chaque jour. You can do one, one good action per day. So this means I will go there once a year in the summer and teach a class. And sometimes I will bring just books. Apparently during that period also, my name was put up with the government of Rwanda. They said, oh, there's this Rwanda who comes every, every year. So finally, when they were struggling to do things, I think uh, they uh, approached me to be minister of education and, and came back and when they asked me in 2001, I had just become full professor of physics and, and chair of the Department of Physics uh, at Clark. I had my career, scientific career there, but I said, I've already published 70 papers. 
In my career, probably I would publish 200, but Rwanda probably needs me more than probably the university. Then, then few months later, I, 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 flew, I flew there. But I, I think that everybody in their diaspora, they have something to give. I hear somebody say, oh, I am working to, to build a lab. No, 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 don't want to build this big lab. Just go there and do something. Okay, so that, in, in my opinion, will be that. But coming back on the issue of inclusivity, I thought that uh, the course on science diplomacy will help actually those scientists from the developing country to build the skills, to, bring, to build the awareness. So what we started as a very small course at the beginning, now we have courses in all the five regions of the academy, and we actually we train the trainers. So it is really going everywhere in that. I can give some examples probably later, but I would like to probably stop here on, on this particular component. Scientists from the diaspora, they have a role to play. They have knowledge. Their knowledge can be used for the betterment and, and life of the, of the people in their, in their country. They don't need to go there. They can do every year something. Let me come back then to the issue um, raised by uh, uh, Vadinyam on the issue of natural sciences and, and social sciences, but also I think uh, uh, um, um, our colleague uh, uh, Melody brought about it. If you look at mostly natural sciences, you have issues related to the commons, let's say the Arctic. This is a physical place, it's, phys it's a physical. If you look at the climate, if you look at the climate, it, it, it is physics. If you look at the boundary water between transboundary water between two countries, if you took the Nile, you take the Nile, the natural sciences will bring you the knowledge. Can I build a bridge on the Nile without draining the water? Science can give you that, and countries can sit down and use that rather than trying to fight between themselves they can sit down and make that decision. How do you share the water between countries? Natural sciences can you can give you that. However, there have been that natural sciences cannot give us. For example, the issue, the behavioral issues. Let's say you, you are in the same country and you have two ethnic groups, you know? This ethnic group, they are all human beings, you know that. So humanity, so social science can tell you we are all the same. So the knowledge of social science can help use that knowledge as a diplomatic tool between the two to be able to make people together. If we take people in Rwanda, the Hutu and the Tutsi in Rwanda, what happened? Do you think that there is really a difference between them? They speak the same language. One day somebody asked me, Murens, are you a Hutu or a Tutsi? I told him, no. I gave him my, my finger, I say, take my, my, my blood, and when, if you can determine my ethnicity from my blood, then I will tell you who I am, or you can know who I am. So people want to put you in a box. They want to put you in a box, and then they, they, they close the box. Then they will say, your behavior will be around will be this way. They say, oh, you are black or you are white. So they put you in a box, they make you white. This means that anything you will say, they say, oh, it's because he's a white person. <laughs> oh, it's, oh, it's because he's a black person. They don't consider you that you can have other ideas. Mm. So social sciences will help, I can help bring that, that. Mm -hmm. so that you cannot get that with, with, with natural sciences or with physics or with biology or biology a little bit, but, but you cannot get with that. So, 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 so having together social sciences and natural sciences and data science that can make a huge difference in terms of in terms of uh, science diplomacy and building using knowledge of social science to uh, 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 bring people together thank you
Thank you so much for that, Romain, um, and especially for um, for for your personal refre reflections as well on these issues. I think that brings such a, a richness to the conversation um, uh, in terms of of the the role of the diaspora as well. We're coming up to time, unfortunately, and I'm just about to hand it back to our hosts. But just to say that, um, in 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 sort of wrapping this up, I think um, you know what we've seen is really. The, the complexity of the issues, the contestedness of the issues, the breadth of the issues that really demand a much more inclusive approach. And it's um, so heartening to see that, you know, through your examples um, and, and your experiences that you've related that we're seeing that that approach is happening increasingly. You know, as we start to recognize so many of our shared global challenges um, really require um, this transdisciplinary, transboundary, um, multi-dimensional approach. Um, some of the mechanisms that you talked about were really firstly the, the breadth of actors that are becoming involved, but also mechanisms like networks, like training opportunities um, that, that I would encourage um, anyone interested in this field to, to seek out, whether it's through, through groups like INSA, through groups like the GYA, the AAAS and, and others. Um, and UCL, <laughs> um, probably leading the pack. Um, I think that uh, one of the, the, the comments around mobilizing the talent um, at the regional level uh, and, and the national level, particularly in countries in the global south, was um, really an important uh, observation and something that we all, all need to think about, this idea that um, capacity development and, and really accessing that high quality uh, talent that exists um, within the regional and, and, and national levels in the, in the Global South is one of the most important pieces of this, um, of this puzzle in science diplomacy um, uh, and, and linking you know, local right through up to, um, to, to global actors in this space. Um, in terms of the types of, of diversity, that insistence on, on epistemic diversity, whether it's from different ways of knowing through indigenous knowledge or um, disciplinary diversity, I think is an important piece of this too. And um, here, here for, uh, for the inclusion of um, social sciences, arts and humanities in, in all of this work. So um, unfortunately, I'll have to close it there. We, we, I tried to sort of wrap some of the, the audience questions with some of the prepared questions, and I hope we got there. Um, but I'll turn it over now to um, Adriana, uh, our host, um, to close off today's session. Thank you so much to all of the panelists for your input and your thoughts and uh, your generosity with your time. Thank you. Thank you. So we did have a question in the chat about, um, we, we have still have a couple of minutes to answer this. Um, maybe Ramon uh, from, uh, oh, okay, yeah. So how do scientists in the diaspora who have already been ostracized by decision makers uh, work to break these boundaries um, to, that, they, that currently exist and sharing what they know, regardless of stereotypes, uh, when walking into a, into the room, uh, would you like to answer that? <laughs> Very. I think is as I said, um, there are many ways uh, to give your uh, your contribution uh, to the South, in particular to uh, a country, um, through online online discussions. And, and uh, even if your country doesn't want you, because there are maybe situations where you may, you may be uh, away from your country because of the, the situation there. But uh, you can always make a, a contribution. Uh, there are many, many platforms that where you can have a, an opportunity to make a, um, a contributions, uh, like uh, discussions like these ones and, and other type of discussions I think you can do that. But uh, what I have seen is that uh, uh, government are, are not eternal, so they, they come and go. So this means that actually people who have been refugees at some point, at some point they, they return back to their country. They have a way to contribute. This way, for example, to us has been, a, has been at the forefront of our, uh, supporting uh, science in exile, being refugee, being displaced scientists because the refugee of today 
is going to be tomorrow a contributor to his country's uh, country's development. And I, I have seen that many people actually had opportunity to return. Being uh, Rwanda would, would be an example, but uh, I can give other examples when people actually left their country, spent five years, ten years, and returned back to their country or contributed in way one way or another. Um, so there are global for, fora where we can contribute, like these ones. But if it's betting in conference, but giving your voice, uh, you, you don't need to be uh, against and, and speak, you know, f against the government. But you can always contribute in, in a more in a positive way to the development of your country outside. There are many ways one can do that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. That's a great way to close. Uh... So I would just like to thank our moderator today and the panelists for a great discussion. I think these ideas are really helpful for early career scientists who are applying, uh, submitting to the issue. And thank you for encouraging involvement of the next generation in science diplomacy. I'd also like to thank once again, UCL Steve and our outreach partners for helping support this event and promoting it ahead of time. And feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions about the special issue. And I'd just like to point out the next event, I'll tell you a little bit about um, our writing workshop. So if you learned, uh, hopefully you learned some great content and knowledge here today from our panelists. Uh, so next on March 5th, 5 and 6, we'll put this into practice. We'll have a writing workshop organized by the Global Young Academy Incubator Group uh, on Science Diplomacy in the Americas. Um, of course, uh, with our partners, um, you'll have opportunities to write policy papers on science diplomacy that you heard from these two webinars and think about improving your submissions for the issue. Uh, and we'll have some reviewer feedback as well. So we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll post all of our recordings uh, and this one as well there. We also have all of our trainings there since this has come up a few times. Uh, we do also offer trainings. So I'll share again all of our links uh, where you can keep up to date again with our events, uh, future issues. Please subscribe to a newsletter to keep up to date with what's coming up and we look forward to seeing you at the writing workshop. And thank you again to everyone who joined us and have a great rest of the week.